Um, thanks, Brent. Thanks for having us um, give this presentation. I'm John Creasel. I'm an infectious disease doctor at the University of Utah. I'm interested in MS research. And I've been interested in MS research for quite a while. It's, it's a very fascinating disease. It's a disease that seems to have a viral component or perhaps a viral trigger. And I've been interested in this aspect of the disease for at least 10 years, I guess. Um, I've worked in the past with Bill Sibley at the University of Arizona and now here on my own at the University of Utah. And we have a, a technique called deep sequencing that we're applying to brain tissue both from deceased donors who had MS and donated their tissue for study and also to patients who have had brain biopsies um, either in, with acute MS or some other demyelinating disease like uh, clinically isolated syndrome or um, ADEM looking for possible viral components of the disease. So we're pretty happy about our, uh, our grant and our work. Um, and I've been to meetings a couple of times to discuss this and think that this new tool, the sequencer, really um, adds an aspect to the disease that hopefully will help us determine where MS is coming from and help us determine the pathogenesis of the disease so we can provide more effective treatments. Uh, so I'm a virologist by training. I did herpes research in my fellowship after I did medical school residency um, here. Um, and it's long been thought that viruses are a, at least a trigger for MS. Some people have thought that MS is probably a viral disease itself, but the so-called MS virus has not clearly been identified. There have been a lot of clues over the years. For instance, uh, Patients who get colds tend to get uh, attacks of MS more frequently. Uh, we looked at that aspect and uh, weren't able to confirm that cold viruses actually have anything to do with MS, although they certainly do seem to trigger attacks. Um, what we've been able to do is we've been able to, to first identify some specific exogenous viruses in the brains of patients, one patient with MS for sure, and then some other patients uh, who had encephalitis as a sort of practice run to get revved up to really look at what is going on in the, in the case of MS and whether there might be exogenous uh, viruses in the brains of patients with MS. Uh, we haven't found so far exogenous viruses in most of those MS brains, but what we have found is evidence of endogenous viral activation. So that we think that's pretty interesting and it suggests to us that MS could be, at least in part, uh, an endogenous retroviral disease. So there's this whole, uh, this long literature uh, implicating endogenous retroviruses, so-called HERVs, human endogenous retroviruses in MS, uh, starting with uh, Perone's uh, publication in 1989, where he took some, um, uh, some para, paramenigial tissue and was able to find endogenous retrovirus in that that he called the MSRV, later called HERVW. So we've looked at these uh, brain tissue biopsies in MS uh, patients who have been deceased and have found some evidence of uh, endogenous retroviral gene activation. So we're looking at that carefully and trying to figure out exactly what that means and uh, whether it has anything to do with the pathogenesis of MS. Oh, so this, this is a really interesting problem. Endogenous retroviruses are retroviruses that are actually captured by the human genome, in fact by mammalian genomes long before humans. So you can imagine a world where there was no, uh, no treatment for HIV. It wouldn't be a very good world, but in that case most of the people would die, but a few people would be able to survive with persistent retroviral infection. And eventually the retrovirus would incorporate into the germline and become part of the human genome. Well that's what's happened in the past with uh, a number of so-called endogenous retroviruses that are scattered throughout the human genome. Uh, some of them are more recent than others. Um, 
and they constitute, these endogenous retroviral genes constitute about 8% of the human genome. And then there's another uh, large component of endogenous uh, retroviral elements, so-called retroelements or transposons, uh, that uh, comprise a large portion of the human genome. So these things are, are interesting and so far they've not been very well uh, characterized or um, have not been implicated in major human diseases, um, but there's a suspicion um, based on our sequencing that they may actually play a role. So we're trying to figure that out, um, trying to do the, the right tests so that we can, um, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff and figure out what's going on in the brains of these patients. Yeah, when we did our first sequencing run uh, with the you know, not, the techniques obviously are evolving, the sequences are getting longer, the analysis techniques are getting better, but when we first did that first sequencing run several years ago, we, we found in one of the samples it had a, a, a very strong signal for a virus called GBVC, otherwise known as hepatitis G virus, which is a flavivirus. It really isn't felt to cause disease in humans. It had never been found in brain before, so we were able to show that that virus, in fact, infected uh, one of these donors with MS and that uh, it was being expressed and was replicating in the brain of these patients. So we published that in 2012, I think, in PLOS One and showed what we could do and what our techniques were. Then in uh, last year, we published another paper, again in PLOS One, showing that we could take uh, encephalitis controls, so-called other neurologic disease controls, and find viruses in five or seven of those cases, including two measles cases and uh, three cases of herpes encephalitis. So this sort of shows what we can do and how we can uh, map these viral sequences onto the genomes and either prove or disprove that there are viruses, um, active viral replication or viral sequences in the brains of these patients. Right, uh, so we have a hypothesis. Uh, it's far from proven. Um, what we think, or what we suspect, is that the endogenous retroviruses are active, activated in the brains of MS. We don't know why they're activated, whether they're activated by something else, or whether there's some sort of mutation or uh, genetic rearrangement that goes on. Um, but what we found is there's endogenous retroviral activation not only in the MS brains but also in the other neurologic disease controls, that is the encephalitis brains. So we suspect that it may be a common pathway, right? That demyelination is just simply a response to uh, uh, foreign, uh, so-called foreign, or what the body believes to be foreign gene expression and potentially protein expression. Um, and that would explain why there's endogenous retroviral activation both in the MS cases and in the OND controls out of proportion to that uh, in the normal controls that we've also run. So basically, to sum it up, we think it goes like this. Uh, whatever the inciting event is, uh, endogenous uh, retroviral gene expression, which is then sensed as self in the proper MHC background, which leads to demyelination. And that way, uh, there's a suspicion among those in our group that uh, MS is in fact a retroviral disease, but not necessarily an exogenous retroviral disease. It's not like HIV or HTLV. It may be an endogenous retroviral disease with an aberrant immune response. So this, this is sort of appealing to us because we think it, it brings together both the viral hypothesis of MS, but it also uh, folds in the concept that MS is in fact an autoimmune disease and it is human genes that may be driving the uh, immune response in the brain. Our, our, uh, our work here has been funded uh, in the past by the MS Society and then by the NIH, NINDS and now more recently again by the National MS Society here in the U.S. Uh, 
we're going to talk all week, I guess, about various aspects of the project, exactly how it's done, uh, what we're finding, what we're looking for, uh, what's next.